The Ontario Diagnostic Days on realagriculture.com is brought to you by the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, the University of Guelph, Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association, and sponsored by the Grain Farmers of Ontario, Agris Co-op, BASF, Bear and DeKalb, Corteva and Pioneer, Great Lakes Grain, The Mosaic Company, and Syngenta. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to Ontario Diagnostic Days, episode number five. Today we're going to talk about crop staging and how you can use an understanding of plant development to ensure you get the best yield and productivity from your crop. To start things off, we're going to begin with Horse Bonner, Omafra soybean specialist. Horse will take us from the soybean VE stage all the way to R8 and highlight management opportunities throughout the season. We're then joined by Joanna Fallings and Peter Johnson to discuss staging wheat. Our dynamic duo offer tips on how to keep a sharp eye on crop development throughout the season to help you grow great wheat. Omafra's Christine O'Reilly will then take a look at grass management and discuss how and why staging grasses is critical for top forage production. Next up, we're joined by University of Guelph Associate Professor Dave Hooker. He'll review the three different methods you can use to stage your corn crop. We'll then move to canola and hear from Omafra's Megan Moran. She'll highlight the oilseed's critical growth stages and the role they play in managing crop inputs, disease, pest, and timing harvest. We'll wrap up the episode with Dave Hooker and Omafra plant pathologist Albert Tenuta. They'll look at local disease testing in cereal and corn disease nurseries and the role this research plays in the success of Ontario growers. Again, this episode, CEU credits are available for CCAs who have registered for Diagnostic Days. Look for the URL where you can apply for your credits. You'll see that on the screen at various points throughout the episode. And finally, we want to give you an opportunity to engage with the experts. As usual, we've put all their contact information at the end of the video. We also encourage you to put your comments and your questions in our YouTube comments section as you're watching the video. We'll get you some answers. Here's episode number five. Welcome, it's Horst Bonner, soybean specialist with Omafra. So we're gonna think for a few minutes about soybean growth and development. And of course, when you think about that small seed going into the soil, the first thing that happens as the water is absorbed, a little radical comes out, that primary root, and then from there, the hypocaudal extends and pushes that seed through the soil surface. So when we have 50% of those little seedlings emerged, that's the VE stage or V emergence. Now, of course, as that cotyledon is being pushed through the soil surface, if there's any kind of crusting, uh, it can be quite a challenge. And then the hypocotyl begins to actually bloat and swell and it can break off during that hook stage. So that's a vulnerable stage for the soybean to get through the ground. Then of course the cotyledons open up and that first unifoliate opens and that's when we uh, generally we just call that the unifoliate stage when those little unifoliates are open and after that of course each one of the following stages we just simply go with the trifoliates during the vegetative growth stages now that those little early seed leaves those cotyledons are important because of course they store a lot of the energy for the seed early on even up to the first trifoliate. So we don't like to see those fall off or be broken off. Um, although if you take off one, the plant is generally okay, that early little cotyledon. Now, if you break off both as the seedling is coming through, you will have a yield reduction. Some studies show as much as 20%. 
Okay, so we count the number of trifoliates that are completely unfurled, the leaflets. That's how we count the stages during the vegetative growth uh, phases. And of course, what we love to see is before we get into the reproductive phases, we love to see up to six trifoliates. That's ideal. And here in Ontario, that's one of the challenges that we have to get all those nodes built before flowering begins. Okay, fine. So now what's R1, reproductive one? That's when we find one open flower anywhere on the plant. And then of course we go from R1 to R2 and R2 is an open flower on one of the top two notes. So just the top two notes. R3 then is beginning pod and what we're looking for then is a small little pod developing on one of the top four nodes. We go to um, anywhere on the plant, R1, on the top two nodes for R2, and then the rest of the phases are all based on the top four nodes. So you can see this um, divide right here. These ones were planted June 10th. These ones were planted May 22nd. And you can see here, of course, that these pretty little beans are, well, let's take a look. One, two, three, four. Obviously, we're past R2. We've got flowers there. And we've also got little pods developing. So are we at R4 is, of course, the question. And the answer is no. One of these would have to be three quarters of an inch long. Now, how is this important, of course? Right from R4 four on from R4 to R6 is the most crucial phase in terms of yield development and this is when the plant is most susceptible to stress more so than any other growth phase so if you hit this plant with drought right now or with aphids or with spider mites that's when you'll see a major reduction in yield so now let's think about R5 or beginning seed. So what we're looking for at R5 is on one of the top four nodes, the pods there, if we were to open them up, we would find just tiny little seed developing three millimeters long and certainly not fully developed. That's R5. Now, interestingly enough, at this growth stage, maximum plant height is attained usually and leaf area index, and also node number. So very important uh, this stage. Now, if we, hopefully we never see this, but if we were to have complete defoliation here due to hail or something else, this is such a critical stage, we would see a 75% yield hit. Now, if you think about R2, back to that full flower for a second, 50% of the plant's height is often attained and about 50% of the total node number, just for comparison to R5. Okay, so then what's R6? We get excited about R6 because by the end of R6, we often say that there's really nothing you can do anymore in terms of management, aphid management, or, or other, other forms of, of management. And of course, the reason for that is the seed is fully developed and it's basically drying down. So at R6, we, again, are looking at one of the top four nodes. And what we would see is that within that pod, the seed is still green, fully lush, but it reaches from one side of the pod to the other and it's completely full. So that's R6. So now we're going to think about R7. So that's beginning maturity. So what you're looking for then is one of the pods on the top of the plant to have turned color to a brown or tan. And of course, if you open up that pod, the seed inside has lost all its green color. So that's the beginning of R7 and that seed is considered physiologically mature because it's basically just drying down from that point on. Okay, so then R8 is when 95% of those pods on the plant have turned color to brown or tan. And uh, usually it still takes a week to two weeks before 
the combine can get in there. So at the beginning of, um, or at the R7 stage, generally we're at about 60% seed moisture. And of course, obviously we don't start combining until we're hopefully somewhere around 14. And often of course it's uh, 16, 17, or maybe even 18%. So a couple of final thoughts. Some of the key um, strategies to maximizing yield, of course, is to protect those flowers from disease and also just to try and get the, the plant to not abort so many flowers and pods. So that's why we talk about spraying a fungicide relatively early, late R1, even for white mold control. If there's no white mold, we talk about R2, even into R3. And if you look at this plant again, that's at R3, you can see there's still lots of open flowers. That's why that window is a little wider for fungicide application. But if we're going for white mold and we're going to spray twice, certainly the second application in my estimation should be on by R4 at the latest. So that, that's very important to know. That's if you've already put one on, right? Uh, that would be the second application would be by R4 at the latest. I try and put it on at R3 even because of course the whole idea is to protect that plant early on. And after that, of course, we're still worried about aphids. We're still worried about spider mites if they are really devastating the plant like we talked about. So much of yield is built later in the season. We can't give up on some of those management strategies until we're into R6. Peter Johnson at WheatPeatRealAgriculture.com and I'm here today with the cereal specialist for the Ministry of Agriculture and Food, Joanna Fallings. And this is awesome. Two cereal people <laughs> in the field at the same time. We're going to talk to you about staging your cereal crops and how to make money out of doing that. So first we're going to refer to what is called the Zadok scale. So you've probably heard Peter and I talk multiple times about growth stage 32 or growth stage 15. Well, what the heck does any of that mean? And so the Zadok scale is really just a way to identify each of the cereal growth stages. So the first number in that two digit number is always going to refer to the primary growth stages. That second number is then going to refer to the secondary growth stages. So zero to nine, that's germination. Doesn't, nobody really cares too much about that. 10 to 19, that's where we get into the seedling growth stage. So that first number means seedling, and then that second number means number of leaves. So if we're at four leaf stage, that's 14. Once we get into tillering, that's where we get into 20 to 29. So if we're at two tillers or one tiller, that'll be growth stage 21. Then we start to get into uh, boot stage, anthesis stage, and ripening and maturity. And those stages you can refer to on the visual here. But really what we want to talk about is what all these growth stages mean in terms of the decisions that you need to make with regards to your management. And that's what we're going to talk about next. Absolutely. So let's start at seeding and that seedling stage because we have to get enough plants established and hopefully you're all seeding. Come on, right? I beat on them enough. You're all seeding by seeds per square foot, seeds per foot of row. And we're looking, for example, at 25 seeds per foot of row. Does that mean we get 25 plants? Not a chance. Get out, do your counts when that crop is just emerging, because you plant winter wheat now, it's beginning of September, and you'll get maybe 98% establishment. You don't need as high a seeding rate. You get to the 1st of November, man, you can sometimes get less than 60% seeding rate, or pardon me, establishment, and, and man, you gotta up that seeding rate just to get enough heads. So absolutely, you wanna get out there and count it, in that seedling stage, you know, before it has three leaves or something like that. And the other thing on spring cereals is we want the nitrogen kind of in that early growth stage because we want it there before tillering to make sure that we get tillering. So tillers, tell us that. So tillers, this is the most important part. And as Peter mentioned, you really want to get out this fall and we want to see at least two to three good tillers before going winter. Why? Because it'll improve your chances of survivability, but those fall tillers produce more yield than those spring tillers. So how do we identify those tillers? Well, simply you go out there, you do some digging in a couple areas of the field. You want to identify that main stem and simply count the number of tillers coming off. So here we've got one and we've got a second tiller showing up here. So we're at the growth stage 22 or Zadox 22. 
And why is tillering so important? Because this is where you're going to be making decisions with regards to your nitrogen. If you've got no fall tillers, well that spring early green up, we want to be getting out there and getting that nitrogen on. If we've got lots of growth and lots of good tillering in the fall, we might be able to pull back a little bit and wait a little bit further along the growth stages before we make those nitrogen applications because we have those tillers there. Next, we're going to talk about stem elongation, a critical part of staging the wheat to get the most income and, and make the right management decisions. So, it gets tough here. It's the one time that I actually have to dig the plant out and slice it open. So, grow stage 30, we're, we're just at the start of stem elongation, and, and how would you describe that, Joanna? I like to describe it, it's when the wheat gets its good posture. Right, so it, all of a sudden it goes from being prostrate to standing up, those leaves stand up, stand up because all the leaf sheaths have started to elongate, and then the growing point starts to move. So that's a growing point to, starts to move, the only way to tell is actually pull a plant out, dig a plant out, slice it open, and you'll see that, that head moving away from the, the crown, that base of the plant, when it gets half an inch away, that's growth stage 31. So now we're really into looking at growth regulators and nitrogen timing, but fortunately it gets easier because that node continues to elongate, the stem elongates, pushes the node above the soil, and then how do we tell nodes after that, Joanna? Right, so all you simply do for feeling those nodes is you run your fingers along the stem and you should feel that swollen bump in the stem. The nice thing is they're very easy to identify just by looking at it. If the stem below that as you crush it is hollow, you know you've got a node above there. So you're at growth stage 31, you feel that first node. If you slide your fingers up further, it's still hollow in the stem and you feel that other bump, you know you are then at growth stage 32, which is extremely critical. At this point, all of your herbicide applications should be made, full stop. We should have good weed control in our fields by this point. This is also the very critical point for our second nitrogen applications. So we talked a little bit earlier about if you've got lots of tillers in the fall, you might delay some nitrogen. This would be the time to put that single application on or if you put some early nitrogen on to promote that tillering, this might be the time that you go in and put that second application on. Next, we're gonna talk about that flag leaf. Yep, so flag leaf, that's the most important leaf. And as you feel up the, the stem, the, the first node is the first leaf, if you will. And then the second node will be the second leaf. And the flag leaf is the fourth leaf. That uh, gets a little tough. By the time you feel that second bump, the leaf emerging from the whorl is almost for sure the flag leaf. We have to keep that flag leaf clean and we, we just cannot. Once we see that flag leaf, no more herbicide applications. It's just too much risk for the benefit that you get. So all that, that weed control, it should have been done last fall, it should have been done early on spring cereals by the three leaf stage at flag leaf, full stop you're done. Now we got to talk about fungicides. Yep. So keep the flag leaf clean and if you're in a two pass kind of fungicide situation you actually get more bang from putting your first fungicide on at about the time that flag leaf is starting to emerge rather than way back when you put on that weed control. If you're not in a two pass system then really it comes down to the fusarium timing and now we're into heading. Yes, so once we get to that heading stage, we should be looking for that day zero. So what we call day zero in winter wheat is when 75% of your heads have fully emerged in your wheat field, we can consider that day zero. Now what does day zero mean and when do we apply our fungicides? Well, recent research has shown that this application window might be a little bit wider than we had originally anticipated. So you may have historically heard us say day two, target day two, which is two days after day zero. But now that window is a little bit wider and so we can actually time those T3 fungicide applications up to say day three, day four. And in some instances, if we really have to, we might even have to go to day five. But what we're really targeting is that day two to day four. So 75% of the heads emerge and two days after that is go time for our T3 fungicide and that's really critical when it comes to protecting against fusarium head blight. 
So the other stages that we have just quickly to finish up. Well, if you, if you want higher protein, now one thing about nitrogen, we, we want that early nitrogen because we want to stimulate tillering. Mm -hmm. And then we want the second nitrogen application because we want to have lots of nitrogen there for grain fill, for, for the seed set in the head. You've got to have lots of nitrogen there to get lots of kernels in the head. And then we talk about protein. If you're into a hard wheat situation, then we want to maybe look at a later nitrogen application. Could be flag leaf, could be boot stage. Miss anthesis, miss pollination, because we don't want to damage the crop there. Nothing and there. then you could go 10 days after. So that's sort of the nitrogen management thought process as we look at wheat staging. And last, of course, is burn down. Yes, so sometimes we might run into the situation where we have, you know, intense weed pressure or our crop is not drying down as evenly we'd like to see. We've got some late tillers coming along and so we might be required to put down a pre-harvest burn down. This staging is so, so critical because we do not want to get any uptake in that crop. So what we're looking for is the peduncle, which is the uppermost uh, stem just below the head of the wheat. Once that turns color from green to gold, brown, however you like to refer to that color, once that turns color, then we know we can safely apply that herbicide or pre-harvest burn down. But again, it's really, really critical to make sure that that peduncle has turned color and that we're not seeing that uptake in the grain at the end of the day. Yeah, and it actually has to turn color fairly decent. We need it to actually go that golden, not just a little bit yellow, a golden color. Because across it, it, the field, 100 percent. We just have to get there if we're going to use a burn down. And that's that's typically just to help harvest. So there you have it. Really cool stuff. We've covered wheat or cereal staging across the board. If you have questions, you can certainly contact either one of us. Whatever you do, learn how to stage your cereals right, because if you do, you'll apply things better and you'll make more money. Grow great wheat. Hi everyone, I'm Christine O'Reilly and I'm the Forage and Grazing Specialist with OMAFRA. So today as part of growth staging and management for different crops, we're going to talk about growth staging for perennial forage grasses. So why is this important? The biggest benefit of correctly, time, of correctly staging your grasses is to get the timing of cutting or grazing right. If we can get that timing correct, we can improve the productivity of the stand, we can improve its persistence, and we can properly balance yield and quality for the type of livestock we're trying to feed. And that's really the whole goal with perennial forages, is improving persistence and optimizing yield and quality. So hopefully this slide looks somewhat familiar to you. It's the Zadox scale. And those of you who are used to staging cereal development will probably be comfortable with this system of staging crop growth. Zadox is also useful for perennial forages because it can be used on any grass species and cereals are just an annual grass that we've selected for seed production. So while we can use Zadox to stage perennial grasses, there are some differences between perennial grasses and cereals, just like there are some differences when you get into those secondary growth stages between cereal species. So the first big difference is that when we're growing a forage crop, we don't want to get past growth stage 60. That's going to be our biggest difference, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about why on the next slide. So, This slide is more of a visual depiction of that Zadox scale, and when we start thinking about how perennial grasses are different than cereals, one example that comes up is growth stage 29. So the description for this is that the plant has a main stem and nine or more tillers. That works great for describing cereal development, but with perennial grasses, they can have dozens of tillers. So potentially, depending on the time of year and the grass species, we may be in growth stage 29 for a very, very long time. When we're trying to get that timing right to really get the most quality or the most yield that, that suits our situation. Um, looking at the stage really comes into play. So our maximum quality for grazing tends to be during tillering and before stem elongation. This is really when leaves are actively photosynthesizing. The plant is mostly leaf, so there's lots of sugar, there's lots of protein, it's highly digestible. This is the optimum time to get livestock out there grazing because they're going to get the best quality forage we can give them. 
Our timing changes a little bit when we shift out of grazing and into harvesting for hay or silage. So our best quality, our dairy quality or our um, quality for say sheep carrying multiple lambs, that quality is now between flag leaf and boot stage. And the reason it's different from our maximum grazing quality is because of economics. It costs a lot, it's the most expensive part of growing a forage, to actually run harvesting equipment across that field. So we need to have a higher yielding crop in order to justify operating that equipment. And that's why maximum quality for a mechanically harvested forage is between flag leaf and boot stage rather than during tillering. If we're more concerned about yield rather than quality, so we need feed for dry cows or for dry beef cows, um, ewes that are not carrying lambs right now, then we're looking at a crop that's between boot stage and heads completely emerged. So that's where we're getting our maximum yield. The stock is starting to lignify, so digestible fiber is going down, but we get a lot of volume, we get a lot of tonnage. I mentioned on the previous slide, we don't want to let this crop set seed. So going past growth stage 60 is where not only is that stock, that stem lignifying a lot, but we're also going to start to see the sugars move from the leaves into the seeds. And grasses typically don't have enough starch to compensate for the lignification and for losing those leaves as the plant dries down. So my next slide is a bit of a reminder about how heat influences grass development and some other forage crop development. This could be a whole talk on its own. I just wanted to throw this up as a quick reminder. So grasses are a base zero growing degree day crop. It does not take much heat to push their development along. And so in a cool spring, they're going to be ahead of alfalfa, which is a base five crop. Um, what this means is that grasses are developing faster especially under cool conditions. And because their quality is going to decline more quickly when they hit that maturity, we really should be staging harvest of mixed stands based on grass development, not on alfalfa development. So that's really taking us up to first cut. Once we get to first cut, things get a little bit different in terms of perennial grass development. So we can divide grass species into jointing or non-jointing species. And this really describes how they regrow. So our jointing species, after first cut comes off, they will start to go through stem elongation again. They're gonna try to send up a stem. They're gonna try to head out and set seed a second time. Um, if we were to cut these species during stem elongation, that will remove their growth point because that growth point is rising with each new, new node that's completed. So by taking away that growth point during stem elongation, that's really stressful on that plant. It has to start over by drawing on its root reserves and, and starting it again. If we were to cut that crop while it was still tillering or after it finished stem elongation and was going into boot stage and starting to head out, at either of those times, it's much less stressful because during tillering, the growth point is low, it's still there, we haven't damaged that plant. Um, if we wait until after stem elongation, then the plant has also had time to prepare to send out a new tiller. So it's already in a position to regrow quite quickly. Non-jointing grasses have a different response after first cut. So they tend to remain vegetative. Their growth point stays low. They're not going to send up a, a, a seed head. They're not going to go through stem elongation again, or very few of their tillers will. Um, this means that after first cut, their growth point stays low. It's much harder to stress this crop by harvesting it. The timing gets much easier because it's just going to tiller over and over and over again. So non-jointing grasses are best suited for pastures. They're much better for pasture situations than jointing grasses because it's very difficult to get the timing wrong. It's easy to protect that plant. Um, either jointing or non-jointing grasses can be used for hay or silage. Um, because we've got a, a bit better of a handle on where we're setting that cut height when we're taking mechanical harvest. So what species are jointing? What species are non-jointing? Out of our most commonly grown forage grasses in Ontario, Timothy, smooth brome grass, reed canary grass, and Italian ryegrass are all jointing species. So they're going to go through stem elongation multiple times after each cut. Our non-jointing species are things like orchard grass, tall fescue, meadow fescue, Kentucky bluegrass, and perennial ryegrass. Once they've been 
defoliated once after first cut or their first round of grazing, they're going to stay vegetative and tiller over and over again. How high should we be cutting? That's always a question that I get. So our cut height or our target grazing residual should never be lower than two to three inches. Um, if it's dry out, you probably want to leave a little more leaf material there to speed up recovery and to conserve some soil moisture. And again, that timing is extra critical for jointing species. So it should be either before stem elongation while the plant is still tillering and the growth point is low or after stem elongation is finished when it's entering boot stage, it's heading out and it's already prepared to send out new tillers. One exception to this minimum target residual or minimum cut height is orchard grass. Orchard grass has taller stems than most of the other grasses that we grow and all, a lot of its energy reserves are in those stems. So orchard grass should not be cut lower than three to four inches just to make sure that we're maintaining those reserves. So overall by staging our perennial grasses we can help improve the persistence yield and quality of that crop by knowing what growth stage it's at, whether it's a jointing or non-jointing species and timing our cutting or our grazing activities accordingly. Thank you very much. My name is Dave Hooker. I'm a, a cropping systems agronomist here at Virg University of Guelph Bridgetown campus. And today we're going to talk about corn staging, corn developmental stage staging. Now the crop stage is incredibly important in order to time those stages to specific management. When we go to the doctor, Right away, first question, how old are you? Because the age of a person, of course, well, the treatment will depend on the age of the person. And the exact same thing happens in crops as well. The, the treatment or what we want, how we want to manage it will depend on the crop developmental stage. And so interesting enough, there are three developmental staging methods in corn. There is the leaf tip method, there's a droopy leaf method and then the V stage method. And all three of them are in the literature. All three of them are on the internet. If you read an article, it could be talking about V stage or leaf tip or the droopy leaf method. So it is very important to know the differences on those, uh, across those methods. So the first method that I'd like to tell you about is called the leaf tip method. And the leaf tip method, of course, with every method, it's very important to know or identify what leaf number one is. And so the first leaf, of course, it could be um, chewed off by an insect or uh, maybe a hailstone took it out. So one way to identify leaf number one is by the rounded leaf tip. So the, this is the first leaf right here and it has a rounded tip. And so we can call that leaf number one. So that is leaf number one. And using the leaf tip method on this plant, we can just count the number of leaves. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then the 10th leaf is just emerging from the whirl and we call that the leaf 10. So this is the 10th leaf stage using the leaf tip method. Now the second method is called the droopy leaf method or the, or the leaf over method. So they're, they're the, same, the same method. The droopy leaf or the leaf over. And the last leaf to count using that method is the leaf that is about 50% expanded, fully, fully expanded, and probably it's this leaf. So we're looking at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then this is the eighth leaf, and it's about you know 50% of a full-size leaf. And so this would be the eighth leaf, and this would be the eight at the eighth leaf stage using the droopy leaf method or the leaf over method. So again, it's at the 10th leaf using the leaf tip, 8th leaf using the droopy, droopy leaf method. And then the method number three is called the V stage or the collar method. So here we count the number of collars on the stem. So the leaf wraps around, the corn leaf wraps around the stem and then it forms a, like a collar um, around the stem. And this plant has one, two, three, four, five, six. And so this collar is identified by this little structure of the leaf that wraps around the stem. And this is the last leaf up the plant that, to have this collar. And so this plant is at the V6 stage. 
And so the color method is the only stage where you precede the number with a V. So the others are 10th leaf stage or the 8th leaf stage. The color method uses the V system, and so this would be at the V6 stage. All right, so we've, we know about plant developmental stages now in corn, especially the V stages. We'll get into the R stages um, later on in about a month time from this, um, from this particular time when this corn plant would be soaking. But the V stages, this plant, as we talked about, it's at the V6 stage of development. The V6 stage is a very critical time or a milestone in the corn developmental history because the growing point is right at the soil surface on the V6. If the plant was V3, the growing point would still be beneath the soil surface. That growth, plant growth would be responding to soil temperature mainly, not air temperature. But at the V6 stage, the growing point is above or at the soil, soil, the soil surface. And so that this plant right now will be responding more to air temperature than to soil temperature. So at the V6 stage, the nodal roots, the crown roots, they become the main root system. And often there's a delay in growth between at the V4, V5 to V6 stages because of the, it's just, the corn plant is, just, is, is starting to switch from the seed roots to the crown roots. And the crown roots become the main root system at the V6 stage. And another thing interesting about the V6 stage is that a frost could severely injure or even kill the corn plant at the V6 stage if that growing point was injured by a frost event. And then another critical thing that happens at the V6 stage is that the number of rows in an ear of corn, the number of rows is actually determined between V6, V7, V8. And so this is a, a critical time. It determines um, uh, the, one of the yield components of corn, and that's the number of rows per ear. Now that's mainly a genetic trait. So it depends on the hybrid, the number of rows, but it does get influenced by environmental conditions as well. So it could vary between, for instance, a 12 row ear or a 14 row ear, or the environment could play an effect, depends on, um, it could affect the ear, whether it puts on 16 rows or 18 rows. The environment usually has a relatively minor effect on the row number, um, but genetics play a major role in determining uh, the row number. And then when the plant gets a little bit taller at the V10 to V12 stage, then the, the maximum or the number of kernels per row is determined at the V10 or V12 stage. So that's when 12 collars are formed on, around the stem. And so that's when the plants are about, are about waist high or so, waist to chest high. That's when the number of kernels per row is determined. So when we have a very serious event, so drought conditions or other stress conditions, it could cause a potential number of rows or the number of kernels per row to decrease. Hi, I'm Megan Moran, canola and edible bean specialist, and I'm going to talk about critical growth stages in canola, focusing on spring canola, but I will mention the winter crop as well. And I'm going to kind of walk through uh, based on the different field activities that we do, starting with herbicide timing. So most of us grow Liberty Link or glyphosate tolerant spring canola, and those products are safe to apply right from emergence through to early bolting. Of course, it's more important to look at the growth stage of the weeds and time your herbicide application to the appropriate weed growth stage. Uh, for fertilizer, we're applying our nitrogen and sulfur, our phosphorus and potassium pre-plant, and we're not putting our nitrogen and sulfur in the seed row. Uh, it can be toxic in the seed row. If we want to come in crop with some nitrogen or we're split applying our nitrogen, uh, we want to put that second app on at up to the six leaf stage, maybe eight leaf stage. If we see some sulfur deficiencies, we can apply a rescue application of sulfur up to early flowering. If we start to see some little pods developing, it's probably too late for that uh, late application to be economical. So I grabbed this slide from the Canola Council website. Um, and as you can see with the green line for nitrogen, uh, the crop really needs that nitrogen at elongation and so, or bolting. 
So we need to put the nitrogen on ahead of that stage, let it wash into the roots. So again, uh, up until about the six leaf stage. Now, this is a spring canola study. Uh, when I think about winter canola though, it's kind of the same thing. We, in the fall, our winter canola reaches the six leaf growth stage. Then in the spring, as soon as it gets warm, it'll put on buds and start to elongate as, as soon as it's warm enough. So we wanna get that nitrogen on the winter canola as soon as we can. For flea beetle, which is primarily a pest of spring canola, uh, the critical growth stages are from emergence to the four leaf stage. And so with treated seed, the flea beetle have to feed on those cotyledons before they'll be affected by that seed treatment. Um, and then they, canola plants can tolerate up to, if the flea beetle are still feeding, it can tolerate up to 50% defoliation. And so we set the threshold at 25% defoliation though, because uh, they move so quickly and it takes time for us to get the sprayers out in the field after we uh, decide to pull the trigger. In a, in a cold spring like this year, um, the, the flea beetle are driven down in the canopy under the plants and they'll start feeding on the stems, as you can see in the bottom right hand image. And so we, we're less tolerant of stem feeding. Uh, if they chew through the stem, that's essentially 100% defoliation. Um, and so once a crop reaches the four leaf stage, typically it can outgrow any damage if there was less than 25% defoliation and, and grow right through even with those flea beetles present. Um, but, you know, if the field is sitting wet or you have a nutrient deficiency or the crop's just not growing vigorously, then um, you may need to monitor it longer. Um, it, it won't, may not outgrow the flea beetle in those cases. We do see some late season flea beetle feeding. They'll strip the pods, which is an issue for diseases and shattering, but there is no threshold for flea beetles at those late growth stages. Um, this is just a picture on the left from one of my plots where we had a lot of flea beetle, and, uh, but it's not common to see this across a field. And if there was a threshold, you know, it would be, you, it would have to look like this, a hundred or more flea beetles per plant. But again, this is very rare and, and uh, we don't typically apply insecticides this late. Plus we have to watch those pre-harvest intervals on the insecticide. Sweet midge is not a pest of winter canola. Uh, it, our spring canola growers though are very familiar with this pest. And so it, uh, critical growth stages are from the one leaf stage through to flowering. They'll lay their eggs on, on the growing points of the plant and if they get in there early, they can prevent the plant from bolting, uh, like in the picture on the left. And so, um, you know, in that area of the field, Swede Midge got in prior to bolting, and there's essentially 100% yield loss in that area at the edge of the field in this case. Uh, but once the crop bolts, then we've avoided most of the yield loss issues. And it's not really uh, economical. There's not a good return on investment for applying insecticides for Swede Midge, uh, in the flowering stages. They can prevent the, the branches from elongating, like in the picture in the center, and then we'll get pods low on the, on the plant, which is a problem for harvest and a bit of a yield issue, but again, uh, doesn't uh, provide a lot of value to apply insecticide at that time. And they can reproduce on flowers, like in the bottom right-hand picture, um, but that's not a, a significant yield loss issue, and we wouldn't recommend trying to control them at that stage. Uh, for white mold, of course, the critical growth stages are during flowering. So um, uh, white mold is an issue in both spring and winter canola. And fungicide application has a good return on investment because that crop canopy is so thick and dense and it's always wet. It's a nice tall crop, always wet in the canopy. And so there's usually a risk of white mold unless it's been extremely dry. And we want to coat as many flower petals as we can. So we apply that fungicide preventatively at 20 to 50% bloom. So at about 15 flowers on the main stem, up to about 25 flowers on the main stem, you may see little pods starting to develop. But again, coating those flower petals in the first half of flowering and before we get significant uh, petal drop uh, to prevent that white mold infection. And sometimes we say it's when it's peak yellow, again, just to coat as many flowers as possible. And uh, cabbage seed pod weevil are the last pest I want to talk about. Same, uh, similar critical growth stage as the fungicide timing. Uh, we will see adult weevils in the spring and winter canola crop whenever there are flower buds present. So even before bolting, but 
feeding on buds isn't a concern. Plants can compensate for that. It's uh, we want to prevent them from laying their eggs in those little newly formed pods because Larvae feed on seeds in the pod and then they exit. You can see a hole in the pod in the image on the right. And that's a shatter loss issue. And um, it opens the pod up to, to diseases. And so we want to spray for weevils uh, right before they lay their eggs. If we go in too early, they'll just reinfest. And so we can often um, time that insecticide application or put the insecticide in with our fungicide application. Uh, so we want to make sure we really are at threshold if we're going to spray insecticide on a flowering crop. So scout with a sweep net in multiple parts of the field, not just the edge of the field. And ideally spraying in the evening or at night to avoid risk to our pollinators. And then finally, uh, harvest timing. Uh, we, with direct harvest, which is uh, most acres in Ontario are direct harvested, we just want all the seeds to be black or brown and below 10% moisture. We can't really deliver grain above 10% and most growers don't have a way of drying canola grain. And so we're opening pods on the branches that mature last, making sure those seeds are brown or black or at least starting to turn brown or black and fewer than 2% are green. And they'll start to rattle when they're dry. You might wanna open up the field and, and test the harvest moisture or grain moisture. Um, if it's a really hot, dry day, you might be able to start harvesting at 11 or 12 percent because uh, grain moisture can drop through the day. But ideally, just harvest as soon as it's ready to avoid any shatter losses or or so it doesn't get rained on uh, in the meantime. And the stems may still be green. The pods could be any color on the outside. Uh, there's some swapping happening in really short season areas in the north. And in that case, they're just making sure the bottom third of plants on the main stem are black. Uh, the middle third of seeds in pods on the on the main stem are turning black or mostly black. And then the top third can still be green. And that's all I have to say. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And if you have any questions, you can contact me anytime. When it comes to Cereal production in Ontario and winter wheat production, Fusarium head blight is a challenge every year, both from an educational extension standpoint, from a production standpoint, from a recommendation management standpoint as well. And it's been a constant battle. And we've seen over the years how that's evolved and changes. And one of the key components there is, is modeling, Doncast predictions and that. And fortunately today we've got Dr. Dave Hook, our field crop agronomist at the University of Guelph here at Ridgetown, and we're standing in front of the Ontario Cereal Crop Committee Nursery, Fusarium Head Blight Nursery here at Ridgetown, sister one at Nairn as well. And you can see the misting system goes on uh, on a frequent basis and mists for about three to four minutes, and we get perfect environment for Fusarium. And as I said, Dave was one of the pioneers when it came to the development of Doncast. And Dave, Thank you for standing here and getting wet. And, and you know, tell us about what happened. You know, why did we go to Doncast? Why did we need some extra management for Fusarium? Well, th thanks, Albert. And this actually feels great on oh. a hot day. So 1996 was the year, that epidemic year, just a terrible year, and we needed to do something uh, right. in terms of managing the disease a little bit better and in dawn accumulation. And one of the things that we looked at on the Ontario Corn or Cereal Crop Committee looked at was varieties, variety mm -hmm. registration, variety testing. And so we, when looking at the disease triangle, uh, we wanted to make sure the pathogen was present and we need to make sure that um, the environment was conducive or favorable for the disease. And this misting trial behind me is set up to screen varieties, to look at the varieties, to sort out the bad ones from the good ones. And hopefully we can eventually evolve our varieties that we use or that we grow into more tolerant, ones that are more tolerant. Yeah. And so in 1996, late, late 1990s, 40% of our varieties that we grew in Ontario were highly susceptible. And now it's less than 10%. So tremendous genetic breeding progress has been made since 1996, which is like 24 years ago. Can you believe it? This, yeah. this takes time. But part of the key components is this misting trial. So this is one of three. And so this misting trial helps to screen out those varieties. 
And it also a benefit in terms of, you know, that public private breeder partnerships as well, right? So we've got these uh, Nairn and, and Ridgetown, but it also fields into the variety development, both from a public breeding programs as well as the the, the private companies yep. as well, right? That's and right. so everybody as an industry has been making fast progress in terms of varieties and susceptibility. We're not there yet by no means, right? Mm -hmm. But we've really moved forward. That's and right. a lot of that is having the right environment. You know, you saw how quickly we got soaked. If we were a, a wheat head with the inoculated fusarium, we're in a perfect uh, position to get inoculated, right, Dave? Yeah. That's cool, right? I think that's a bad joke. Well, I know, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm full of bad jokes and we'll continue doing that. I've made a career out of that. But anyway, so this, is one of the drivers for that. And when we talk about Doncast, varieties play an important um, part of that forecasting exactly. system. Exactly, so a lot of those coefficients that go into the model were derived from, from this misting trial. The differences in varieties are tremendous. One variety could have one part per million of Don, another variety, exact same environment, exact same conditions, could have 20 parts per million. Like the differences in varieties are just, it's just tremendous. And it's an important management factor that we can use, the, just the variety component. And as we go through these uh, varieties here and plot to plot, you'll see ones that are totally clean of fusarium, other ones that are polluted, high, a high infection rate and, and ultimately high dawn levels, which we don't want. But we've gone over those 24 years and weeded out many of those highly susceptible varieties, which is a good testament to the development and the progress we've made. But as I said earlier, we're not there yet. We still have a lot of work to do and we all need to work together to solve fusarium head blight. So just to wrap it up, we have variety, variety tolerance, much better varieties these days, and also we have much better fungicides than we did back then. And so we combine those two factors, it's like a one-two punch, yep. and then we get a great package of, in terms of managing that, that, uh, that fusarium head blight in winter wheat. Absolutely, and that fungicide component there, better, better fungicides and better timing, and know when to get them on, yep, absolutely. Exactly. All right, so we just talked about how management, managing fusarium head blight, how important it is in wheat. Uh, in corn, we're about 20 years behind actually on managing a gibberella ear rot or dawn accumulation in corn. We haven't tested many corn hybrids uh, like we did on the wheat side starting in 1990. On the corn side, we've had various serious epidemic scenarios on corn uh, Every couple years or every four years, we have a tremendous epidemic in corn. And so it wasn't until 2018. 2018 was a very tough year in the corn industry on dawn accumulation in corn. And this is when, again, the industry came together and we decided, hey, we have to do something. We have to manage this disease um, a whole lot better in corn, just like what we did in wheat. So this is why we started this in 2019 in conjunction with a number of seed companies with the Ontario Corn Committee. We started testing corn hybrids in terms of their um, susceptibility to accumulating uh, Dawn, the Dawn mycotoxin. And so we did this in 2019. We learned quite a bit from this setup in 2019. So it involved inoculation and involved misting, creating that favorable environment for the pathogen that's present. And the only thing that's left in that disease triangle is the hybrid. And so that's what we're testing here um, with all of those other factors held constant or relatively constant. So we learned quite a bit in 2019. 2020, this year, we're doing things quite a bit different. We're testing corn hybrids quite a bit different, differently than we did in 2019. In 2020, we have three planting dates now. So we have 54 hybrids, and these hybrids are submitted by seed companies. And those 54 hybrids are planted on three planting dates. And that's so we can get a good window of silking opportunity. Silking is a timing for infection, for the disease. And if we can spread or assess that susceptibility across a very wide window by alternating planting dates, uh, we can really do a good job at assessing that hybrid to see how susceptible it is uh, to, um, to gibberella ear rot and to dawn accumulation. So we have 54 hybrids, three planting dates, two replications per planting date per hybrid. 
So we're really, really looking forward to the results um, in this trial um, coming, come this fall.